It has been a while since I've preached here, and I just want to say thank you guys for letting me get up here and preach. I'm sure some of our chaplains are going, well, thanks for giving us a break and things so we don't have to preach. But today is first week of Advent, and our theme for Advent week one is the theme of hope. We're going to kind of go through these. First week is hope. Next week, you're going to hear about love. The next week is going to be about joy. And then week four is about peace. But this week, it's about hope. And a lot of times right before I get ready to preach, I start digging through some of my old sermons. I kind of go through and just kind of, it's almost like a diary or a kind of a journal where I'm able to go back and revisit some of the experiences that I've had and to kind of really kind of provide some clarity at some moment. And when I was digging through some of my old sermons, I came across one where I started remembering where I was at back at Barbara. And my wife and I, it was we were kind of communicating long distance, and we were, I was at Barbara at the moment at the time. She was in Wyoming, and we were trying to plan a, a trip. Something that we looked forward to, something that we hoped to, something we were excited about. And we were going to go. I was like, what do we, what do we want to do? After our post, after this deployment is done, what do we want to do together? And so we thought about maybe, well, maybe we'll go to Disney World, maybe we'll go do some. Ultimately decided on New Orleans and going to see a Saints game, which did not turn out to be nearly as exciting and awesome as we had hoped. I think we ended up leaving New Orleans a little bit early, even. Uh, if you guys watched the Saints game this last week, it, it, was, it was rough. It was really, really rough. But for a split moment while I was there at Bagram, a thought crossed my mind. What if I don't make it back? What if I don't make it back? And for a split second there, it kind of caused me to wonder, going, if I don't make it back, where is my hope? What have I latched on to as my source of hope? What am I looking forward to? What am I looking at saying, ultimately, I'm hoping that there's something better than this moment? So it kind of brings us to this building topic, which is where does your hope lie? Now, if we talk about hope, it's a word that we kind of casually throw around. You know, children hope that they get the Christmas present that they want. Adults hope sometimes that their first date goes well. Man, I really don't want to mess that up. Or family hopes that Thanksgiving will go smoother than it did this last time. We have all these, we even name our kids hope, but we have all these different things. Where does your hope lie? And ultimately, I think hope comes down to a statement. Let me go ahead and go to the next slide. Hope is the expectation of something better than the current situation. Hope is looking, going, there's got to be something better. There's got to be something better than this. And I'm looking forward to that. Where does your hope lie? All right. I can't speak for all of you, but I know there's some of us, when we start asking this question, we know we don't want to talk about it. We want to pretend like we don't think this, but I think there's a lot of us who rely on our own strength. We look at ourselves and we go, you know what? I've got this. I figured it out. I got it. I can do it. Anything that you say before, I can tackle it. And I can't speak for you, but at an early age, I realized that that wasn't going to quite cut it. For me, I started out as a kid, and I realized that maybe it wasn't, I didn't have the quickest reflexes that I thought I did. Every stage of my life, there was a moment there where I realized that my strength wasn't going to cut it. So as a little kid, I used to like to take, and we used to have this flower bed in front of our house. And what, I don't know why, but it was fun for me to try to catch the bees and the flowers. So I'd go with the jar, and I'd see a bee, and I would try to catch it, and it's like, okay, cool, I got a bee. And sometimes I was quick enough to do it. But I remember there was this bumblebee this one time. This was a big one. I was like, I'm going to get this guy. I'm finally going to have something awesome in my jar. And so I went in, and boom! Oh my goodness, the bee did not end up in the jar. My super fast, awesome child reflexes weren't quite kick, quick enough because I ended up getting stung right here. And my eye was swollen. And I realized, okay, you know what? I haven't quite arrived just yet. That's okay, though. I still got time to grow into it. So elementary school, my keen intellect. Man, I was a smart kid. I was growing. All the other kids jealous of my amazing talents. Until I realized they put me before a spelling bee and hey, hey, spelling, how tough is it? Right? Who needs to study? 
And so once I got up there, I started going, and the kids are going through line by line. They're like, all right, spelled it right. He spelled it right. She spelled it right. And it gets to me, and I don't even remember what the word was anymore, but I failed colossally. Within the first round, I was out of there. Okay, so reflexes weren't quite cutting it. And intelligence, I'm not quite getting it. That's okay, I'm still growing. So I made it to my teenage years. My athletic prowess was going to finally come into bloom. I was going to show the world that I think what I was made of. I remember this one time where I was going, I was, for whatever reason, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I know as a teenager, I did a lot of really stupid things at a variety of different times. But this time, I, was, I found this hedge that was along this park, uh, along this sidewalk that I was, I was like, no, I'm just, for whatever reason, I'm going to go hurdle this hedge. So I got up, I sprinted, and I jumped. And I realized that curls was not going to be my area of prowess, either because I bit the concrete face first. It was a bad experience, so, okay. Child, early childhood, elementary, not doing it. As an adult, that's fine. I finally have arrived. I'm a mature adult. I'm the spiritual giant that I, I made it as a chaplain. I am set. I am good. I am ready. I can handle it all. Until we came back to that Barber. So right before I went to Barber, I remember there was a night I was sitting at guitar. I was on the phone the night before I was supposed to fly out. And it was a moment and everything where all of the feelings, all of the anxiety, all the frustration, and the fear associated with going into this deployment and stepping into the unknown kind of came to a head. And it was not a pretty moment. It was a lot of anger just pouring out of me. And I realized at that moment that I did not have it all together. That I wasn't quite put together and ready to face the world as much as I thought I was. And I think there's a lot of us that we have this common mis misconception that's floating around that says, we can do anything we put our minds to. You just put your mind to it and you can do it. Here we go to the next slide. I think probably, if you can read this, and I know most of you probably can't, it says, limitations. Until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can walk. You will never see a flock of penguins flying over your head because no matter how hard that penguin tries, he's not going to be this flying bird. And I think there are so many times that if we put our strength in ourselves, if we put our hope in ourselves, we will be just like those penguins. We're not going to quite, we don't have everything it takes to pull it off. So then we move on to others. Is your hope, maybe it's not rooted in yourself. Maybe you kind of came to that realization earlier, and you said, you know what, I know I don't quite cut it, but you know, there's others. In the 80s and the 90s, the church, to be, the church proved to be a source of a lot of stress and a lot of frustration. Why? Well, even pop culture started to recognize it. The church kind of started becoming a televised phenomenon. Preachers were preaching from the television. People were sitting in the comforts of their home, and they were learning about the Word of God. They were getting lives changed, and things were happening, and people were truly getting to know God. However, people were also not just investing themselves in the God that these preachers were talking about, but they were also investing themselves in the people who were preaching and that wasn't too terribly problematic, right? Until those people started falling from grace. All of a sudden, people started realizing that these people were flawed individuals as well. And so when these people started stumbling, all of a sudden these people who had put their faith in God, but also into these preachers, they started having these crises of faith going, what is happening? This person who has been leading me towards God and teaching me and guiding me in my faith just stumbled. What am I... And so people struggle. Pop culture recognized it. They started talking about people started taking it. As things changed, and a lot of us became aware, okay, well, maybe we shouldn't invest so much of ourselves into these amazing creatures. Okay, well, that's great. But what about other people? How many of us invest, and we say, okay, you know what? We realize we don't put our hope in these people, but we invest a lot of our energy and a lot of our focus, and a lot of our heart into various different individuals. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's an athlete or a musician. I had a buddy of mine who, Kobe Bryant could do no wrong. I don't know how he got to that conclusion. Maybe for some others, social media influencers and stuff. Wow, they just got it all together. If only I could be just like them. Maybe some of you some politician. Maybe it's a military leader. For some of you, maybe it's a spouse or a friend. You want that? What was it for them? I don't know what I would do. Maybe for some of you, it's your children. I mean, 
and they are so innocent. They're so cute, which is great until all of a sudden that innocence, they grow up and that innocence just isn't there anymore. When we put ourselves, our hope into other individuals, we find that we come up empty once again. Why? The Bible is even crystal clear in this. Even the great leaders of the Bible were flawed individuals. Moses. Disobedient. David. And he had a laundry list of things. Let's go with murder. Peter. Liar. Paul. Quarrelsome. These are all individuals who are leaders in the Bible, people and everything who are men and women of the faith. But they are flawed. And when we put our hope in flawed things, once again, we come up empty. What about other things? Things. How about money? I'm going to read you guys a, a parable from Luke chapter 12. For those of you who'd like to join with me, it starts in Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And this is about an individual who stores up all his wealth and ignores God, his hope is in riches. The parable is called the parable of the rich fool. Trying to give you a little sneak preview as to what's coming up. Someone in the crowd said to him, talking to Jesus, he says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what am I going to do? I have no place to store my crops. But then he said, this, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And then I will store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take my eat, eat, drink, be merry. Verse 20 says, but God said to him, you fool. Translated to current culture, fool sounds like an outdated term, you moron. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. When his night comes, his wealth can't save him. And I think we all know this, right? We all know where this is going. Wealth can't buy happiness. We know that. And yet so many of ourselves, we put our time, our money, our efforts, our hopes, and hoping that we can build this financial security so that we're going, oh, I'm set. I'm good. I got it covered. But we know, ultimately, at the end of the day, it just doesn't. If we are rooting our hope in ourselves, if we're rooting our hopes in others, if we're rooting our hopes in things or possessions or anything, then we are going to come up empty every single time. Every single time. So going back to Barbara, when we talk about hope and fear and all that kind of stuff right before I deployed, it was my wife who talked to me on the phone that night. Who kind of heard me just loud me to repent and just, just pour out everything that was welling up inside of me and just going, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to feel. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I just, hope is just, ah, I don't know what to do with it. She called me, talked to me on the phone, and she reminded me of something that I already knew. But how is that a really tough time applying to my life? That this life is a gift from God. And if there was ever a place to put my hope, even as a chaplain, in that moment, I was struggling because of everything else that was right there in front of me, and I just could not, if there was ever a time and a place of who I should put my hope into, it was God. Matthew 10, 26 through 31 says, I'll let you read along with me. It says, do not be afraid of people. Whatever's covered up now is going to be uncovered, and every secret will be made known. What I'm telling you, in the dark, you got to repeat in broad daylight. And what you've heard in private, you announce it from the rooftops. What are we supposed to announce? Next slide. It says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but can't kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of God who can destroy both body and soul in hell for only a penny. 
You can buy two sparrows. Yet not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father's consent. As for you, even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So don't be afraid. You're worth much more than many sparrows. Now this was written to an audience who was keenly aware of death. It was used as a form of punishment. Even the person who is speaking, Jesus himself, is realizes that death will be upon him soon. And yet he says, put your hope in God. Don't be afraid of everything else. Healthy reverence and fear towards God. Put your hope in God because he is ultimately the one who determines your course and what happens to you not only today, but in the future as well. But Jesus doesn't stop there. When we get ready to celebrate this person, we're moving towards Christmas. We're moving towards the celebration of God's greatest gift to us, which was the Son of God, Jesus himself. And God is saying, I'm giving you a gift of hope. Whatever you're facing right now, whatever that is overwhelming, I've got you covered. I've got you covered. Go ahead and go to the next slide if you don't mind. In 1980, I'm going to try to read this story again because I think it reads better than I can speak sometimes. The Soviet Union of the Cold War was a place, much like many communist countries, where religion was kept on a short leash. For those of you think who are frustrated by freedoms or lack of freedoms here in the States, just last night I was reading about another communist country over in North Korea where leather jackets have just been banned because the dictator wore a leather jacket, people decided they wanted to look like him, and they said, hey, no, you can't dress like a man. Okay. You would have thought that would be a thing. But, a lot of communist countries, religion was kept on a short leash. Hope was in the Communist Party and the people. That's a flawed system, folks. Hope in God was frowned upon and often punished if it clashed with the established ruling government. But in 1982, as, excuse me, as Vice President George Bush Sr., represented the U.S. at the funeral of former Soviet leader Brezhnev. Bush was deeply moved by a silent protest carried out by Brezhnev's widow. She stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before it was closed. Then just as the soldiers touched the lid, Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope. What did she do? She reached down and made the sign of a cross on her husband's chest. Hey, okay, folks. Well, What's the big deal there? There in the citadel of secular and atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run it all, the one who had been in charge of everything, hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life. And all that life that was represented by Jesus who died on the cross, and that some, that some way, somehow, the Jesus might have mercy on her husband. She realized in that moment, there needed to be a bigger source of hope. So as I get ready to close, I want to ask yourself, I want to ask you to ask yourself, as I have many times, over and over again, when I'm faced with moments where I don't see the ending, where I get frustrated, or I get disappointed, or I get lost in just the, everything that's going on, is where are you putting your hope? Where are you, what are you latching on to? If hope is the expectation of something better than the current situation, what are you latching on to? And don't just ask yourself, like, yeah, um, Jesus, yeah, me and him, we're good. No, genuinely ask yourself, when you're faced with crisis, when you're faced with those moments where you don't understand what to do, where do you turn? Where do you really turn? Is it to God? Or is there something else that you try to soothe yourself, try to fix? I gotta fix it. I do it all the time, each and every day, where I'm like, ah, just I gotta figure this out. If I can't do it. Instead of turning to God, I try to find every other solution possible. And I'm reminded over and over and over and over again that I'm so thankful that I serve a gracious God who reminds me, who is kind enough to gently go, I'm still here, Bob. I still got you. God reminded Jesus on that Christmas morning because he looked at each and every one of you and said, but you are worthy of my love. I care for you. I care for you. I love you. And I'm going to give you something better to look forward to. 
latch onto that hope. I'd like for you to join me in prayer as we get ready to go to the Lord. And we get ready to do the Apostles' Creed. Um, we get ready to do communion. But as we step forward towards that, as we get ready to move forward in this Christmas season, where is your hope? There's a lot of things that's going to try to distract us. Where is your hope? Please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask first and foremost for your forgiveness. I'd like to say that I always have it together. I've got it all figured out. But then cognitively, I think, I, I realize that you're my source of hope. But Lord, sometimes in practice, I, I try every other way before I turn to you. And each time it comes up empty. But Lord, just like the, the parable of the son who comes back to the father, Lord, you're there to greet me with open arms and you say, hey, welcome back. So I went back on the same page. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for loving each and every one of us who are here. And this morning, if you don't know Jesus, if you're going, hey, I don't really know what that looks like, sounds like, I'd invite you to join with me in prayer as we get ready to pray at the congregation. I think sometimes it's good for us to remember why we do this in the past. So please repeat after me. Please join with me in prayer. As we invite Christ once again to take hold of our lives and to steer us. So please join with me. Dear Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. As we move towards this season of Christmas, guide us. Help us to put our hope in you first and foremost, above everything else. Once again, thank you, God, for loving us. I invite each one of you now to uh, our ushers to please come forward. If you haven't gotten your communion cup, uh, our ushers have our communion cup. It's a little tiny one, so I'll give you a little moment here to try to tear off the top seal because it never seems to want to open whenever you want it to. And we're going to do the Apostles' Creed together. It's written up here for those of you who might have to squint a little bit. Um, but what this is, and everything, this is a, a creed that the early church, if they came together and said, what are we agreeing on? What do we believe and everything that our hope, if we were to try to outline our faith, what does it sound like? So please join with me. And you can read from the screen. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated on the right hand of the Father, I will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alright, if you have your cup and your wafer, In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for everything that you've given to us. As we rapidly move towards Christmas, we say thank you for your care. Peace. 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 Peace.